Dear colleagues, guests, friends, good evening. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to welcome you all to tonight's very spe special lecture by Luis Alfaro. My name is Young Kim, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Onassis Foundation USA, which together with the SES and the SES affiliated group Classics and Social Justice is co-presenting tonight's presentation. I'm particularly pleased that Luis is here to talk with us about his experiences, inspirations, and work at a time when I believe our discipline is at a crossroads. Before I assumed my current position, I was chair of a small classics department in Western Michigan at a liberal arts college where Greek and Latin had been taught for over 100 years. In 2014, due to mounting financial and enrollment challenges, the college initiated an evaluation process that was euphemistically called prioritization, during which every program was assessed using a variety of metrics that I'm sure are familiar to many of you in this room. In the end, a committee determined that our department was a low priority, and all of our language major programs were eliminated, and a tenured colleague was fired. Ours is certainly not the only story like this, and most definitely not the last. Of course, all the impassioned and reasoned arguments we made about the venerability and the relevance of classics, especially at a religious institution, were met with nods of understanding and agreement, but they ultimately rang hollow as the reality of years of fewer graduated majors, fewer students in Greek and Latin courses, and almost no interest in classics expressed by incoming students sealed our demise. Even the long-standing unwritten agreement with administrators of well-enrolled service courses, myth, literature, art, archaeology, compensating for tiny language courses could not save our programs. We could perhaps simply dismiss a story as fallout from the economic downturn that began in 2008, while maintaining guarded hopes that the proverbial pendulum will eventually swing back to the humanities, the classics, as a priority in our institutions of higher learning. Problem is, we had already long lost the battle with students and, quite frankly, their parents. My fear then, that is, if we don't take, uh, as the practitioners and the professors of our discipline, that if we don't take a long critical examination of our field and imagine and implement new ways of doing our work, then I'm afraid classics will become the purview of only the most elite institutions reserved only for those dwelling in the highest of towers. So what is the solution? Well, for one, the point is that there is no one single answer, no one method or approach to reach new and different audiences, a new generation of young people who can learn from the successes and the failures of the ancient cultures we find so fascinating. Yes, our dedication to philology, archaeology, and history must remain foundational, but can we build more diverse, inclusive, and hospitable structures that intersect with a much wider swath of the human experience than we have at this point allowed? Our system needs to change. And so the work of our speaker tonight is as relevant and needed as any of the other papers and lectures we will engage with over the next few days. And I hope that you'll receive a breath of inspiration as you listen to how he has reimagined classics in his own way, thereby introducing the words and the text we treasure to our future, perhaps heretofore unimagined, students, their friends, and their parents. Finally, before we hear from Luis, it's again my privilege to invite a seasoned veteran of our discipline, brilliant scholar and teacher in her own right, who embodies the good work that classics can and should do. Professor Nancy Rabinowitz is an inspiration through her groundbreaking, system-shaking scholarship, and more recently through her work at the intersection of classics and social justice, teaching incarcerated students about the power of Greek tragedy. Will you join me in welcoming her who will then welcome Luis. Well, thank you all. Um, yeah, and thank you, Young, for that flattering and moving uh, welcome. Before introducing our speaker, I have some thank yous to deliver. First, to Helen Collier and the program committee for their inspiration, their uh, enthusiasm in, in embracing our idea and for all their whole help in organizing and publicizing it. Then to my fellow organizers, Mary Hart, who has been invaluable in the glue that made this possible. Mary's the Associate Curator of Antiquities at the John Paul Getty Museum. 
Uh, Melinda Powers, whose work on diversifying Greek tragedy on the contemporary US stage was essential to our thinking about the event. And finally, young Kim, whom you've already heard from, or from whom you've already heard, uh, who secured the Onassis Foundation support necessary for realizing that vision. This event is an initiative from the SCS Affiliated Group for Classics and Social Justice. Two years ago, this group emerged after working to organize a performance by Rodessa Jones and the Medea Project Theater for Incarcerated Women and HIV Circle to the SCS meetings in San Francisco. Rodessa, like Luis Salfaro, is a world-renowned theater artist who has used classical myth to create new works that inspire social justice and prison reform in particular. She's here in the audience tonight, and I wanted <laughs> And shameless plug number one, if you're interested in our group, come to our open meeting Friday at 5 in Tecumseh 4. If you can find it, we'll wait for you. So Luis Alfaro is the perfect individual to continue what we hope will be a tradition of bringing classics out of the convention space and the outside world into the meeting. Luis is an activist, performance, artist, playwright, and poet, not necessarily in that order, and an associate professor of drama at USC. Of particular significance for us, he has worked on ancient texts, making clear their contemporary relevance. A Chicano born and raised in the Pico Union district of downtown Los Angeles, he is deeply embedded in this meeting's location in Southern California. But he's also a national figure, and his plays have been form performed from LA to New York. He's the recipient of many awards, most notably a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, also known as a Genius Award, uh, granted to individuals who have shown exceptional creativity in their respective fields. In just the past year, he's been awarded the 2018 Pan America Laura Pels International Foundation for Theater Award for a Master American Dramatist, the 2018 United States United States Artist USA Doris Duke Foundation Fellowship, and of, again, of special relevance to us, the 2017-18 Ford Foundation Art of Change Fellowship. He was also the co-director and associate producer of new play development for the Latino Theater Initiative at the Mark Taper Forum in LA. He is also the first playwright in residence at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, serving there for six years uh, until 2019. His plays address topics related to sexuality, class, and race, and are typically set in Latinx communities. For some years now, Luis has been at work on a set of adaptations of Greek plays, producing Electricidad, Oedipus El Rey, and Mojada uh, Medea in Los Angeles, all set in Chicano or Latino communities of the present. His adaptation of Oedipus the King, Oedipus El Rey, ran this year at the Public Theater in New York City. I was lucky enough to get a ticket, and it was a dazzling success. I agree with the critic of the New York Times, and it's a must-see. In July, the uh, public will be staging his adaptation of Medea. Get there if you can. Uh, is it only on in July? July and August. Like the ancient plays, these dramas pose more questions than they answer and demonstrate once more that canonical texts can be reworked in radical new ways. The panel tomorrow morning, second plug, 8 a.m., will explore these uh, issues in greater depth. Luis's work is deeply political. First, in that he grounds Greek tragedy in the barrio. But the politics go beyond the text to his actions. Luis is a community organizer using art as a form of activism and he calls himself, I think, a political roustabout. In his reworking of the ancient material, he is not simply gaining cultural capital among the elite. Rather, he immerses himself in the communities where he is performing and that he represents, often working with young people, poor people, and LGBTQ groups. He once said that his work outside the theater was the best way to learn how to ask the right questions. In fact, he said, it was after a poetry workshop for incarcerated teens in Tucson that, quote, I bought a book of 10 Greek plays for $10, and that book opened the door for me. A true community activist, Alfaro has also used his own prominence, for instance, at the taper, 
to encourage and support other Latinx artists, facilitating the production of group performances that offer underrepresented artists and performers a space to create and craft their own responses to contemporary problems and to work collaboratively with others. We are so excited to have Luis Alfaro with us tonight and to start this meeting, uh, which is the 150th anniversary of the founding and maybe the start of 150 more years. So prepare to have door doors open for you tonight in interesting ways. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Wow, hmm. Thank you so much. Now I have an idea how my department might do my eulogy. So it's <laughs> really good to know. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I, uh, I always like to start with an LA story. And today was the perfect LA story. I was uh, just uh, two um, exits away from the car chase that happened this morning for two and a half hours. And I was following it in my car, which I shouldn't have been, on Facebook Live. And um, I, I could see that he was right behind me. And then I got to Oceanside and said, he's just arrived in Oceanside. And I thought, oh my God. So I was gunning it at 85 miles an hour. And, um, and I, he ran out of gas at Camp Pendleton. So <laughs> bless him, because I'm not sure I would have been here. Um, I want to take a moment to also just to take Nancy, uh, Young, Mary. And I just want to say very quickly that um, I would not be here if it wasn't for Mary Hart. Uh, every single production that I've done, Mary has come in in some way and uh, guided me to the journey of how I make a connection between uh, the classics and the contemporary. So I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you so much, Mary. And I also want to acknowledge as a community, yes, yes, thank you. And Mary will be up tomorrow at 8.15 in the morning doing, uh, doing her uh, bit, along with my uh, great colleague Jessica Kubzanski, the artistic director of Boston Court Theater in Pasadena, who directed Mojada at the Getty Villa. So uh, please do come in the morning. I also just want to, as a community member, acknowledge the great Rodessa Jones, who is, um, you know, for many of us who are coming up in the field, that is what we aspire to be. So thank you so much for being here, Rodessa. <laughs> There's a lot of acknowledging, so I'm just let me just do one more acknowledging. It's just to say, in the spirit of community, I would like to acknowledge that we are holding this conference on the traditional homeland of the Luiseño, the Cahuila, the Cupeño, and the Cumeye tribes of California. So here we are. Um, I, you know, it's always hard to start this. It's like a first date, right? So I'm terrified right now. You're all terrified looking. You're beautiful and scary and none of you want me. So I'm just going to try to win you over to say, yeah, thank you, uh, that I'm an artist who uh, uses my, my craft to create social change. And I think my origin story would probably tell you a little bit about that. So I'm going to just take a quick few minutes to tell you that I never, ever work alone. I'm a, what I consider a community-based artist. I work always in community. And um, I guess uh, the most interesting thing about me in the last 15 years is that I took 10 years and did a, a very kind of lonely thing. I, I think of it as a religious thing, which is that I went around the country and I lived in different cities in America for up to a year at a time. And I, uh, and I would just kind of take public transit and learn about the cities. So I was in Hartford, Connecticut. I was in Medford, Oregon. I was in Tucson, Arizona. I was in, um, God, uh, a lot of towns that you don't really want to be in because I kind of choose towns that are having challenges. And, um, and then I just kind of get to know the town. And I, I do the Rachel Ray thing. Do you guys all know who Rachel Ray is? She's a chef. And she says that when she comes into a town, she always says, you know, ask people, what's the place I should have breakfast at? And if three of the locals tell you the same place, that's the place you should go. So my thing is, what's, what's the problem? What's the thing that's going on here? And if the locals all tell me the same thing, that's kind of the place where I kind of dig in. So a good example was when I was in Hartford, I did a project on poverty. Uh, so the poorest city and the richest state in the nation, yeah? And so I uh, worked out of a Catholic church with a priest um, where people would uh, give coins, their coins to the collection box. It was so beautiful and so heartbreaking and so difficult to be in that town, a, a humongous a crystal meth addiction. And then I was in what I call Methford, Oregon, because I also worked on a crystal meth project there. I, I kind of tend to gravitate towards um, 
drugs and gangs and prisons and uh, places where I think uh, people need us the most. So I was mentored by a woman named Marie Irene Fornes, who has just passed, the great American playwright. And Irene used to say to me, go, uh, go to the place that needs you the most. And I literally, I took that literally, right? And so uh, I would live in these towns for up to a year at a time. It could be a little lonely, and it could be a little hard with transit, but I really, uh, I've changed because of it. And I think um, it has a little bit to do with the fact that I grew up in downtown Los Angeles, in Pico Union, um, in an area that was very, very poor and very, very violent. Um, so I didn't know I was poor until about, uh, I think it was five or six, my parents got this wild idea that we should go trick-or-treating in Beverly Hills. And then I went, oh my God, <laughs> we're poor. And so uh, everything changed after that, right? Um, so uh, the way I survived uh, my barrio was that I um, was raised by a lifelong Catholic, uh, my father, and a lifelong Pentecostal, my mother. And somehow they found it in each other to accept each other's religions. And I was the, the victim, I like to say, of um, having to participate in both. So I was an altar boy, and I went to Pentecostal, to those storefront churches with the tambourines. So I did that six days a week, and there was never time to be in a gang or to smoke a joint or do anything, because I, I was praising the Lord and doing service work. And somehow, in the process of doing all of that, uh, the service work became my artwork. So I spent 10 years as a poet. I'm going to stop talking very quickly in a moment, but I'm just trying to get the origin story out. So um, I spent uh, 10 years as a poet and 10 years as a performance artist. So as a poet, I slept in all the great um, floors of America. And then as a performance artist, I slept in all the great floors of Canada, Mexico, and Europe. <laughs> and, then, and then I came to the theater almost by accident uh, uh, through a workshop with uh, Marie Irene Fournes. And my life changed. So I studied with Irene Fournes, and then I studied with a, a wonderful gentleman named Mac Wellman, an experimental, uh, wonderful playwright, and then uh, Paula Vogel. So I sort of think of them as my mentors, right? And, but all along, I was being mentored. All along, I was mentoring, and I was being mentored. So part of, I think, my religious upbringing is you give, and you get, and you do all of that, and you kind of live in it for a long time. So that's what this is kind of about tonight. I, I feel a little Chauncey Gardner, if you get the reference, because I'm, you know, um, I'm wondering why I'm here, right? I just live and I kind of do, and, um, and, and then I just become, right? I just participate in the work, and I marry it, and I jump in wholeheartedly, and I write. Um, both of my parents are farm workers from Delano, California, Central Valley, so I always had a sense that um, there was social justice work to be done. There was always a protest, there was always a rally. When I was a kid, I was a precocious little child, and when I was in sixth grade, I read a book called The Long Loneliness by Dorothy Day. Do you guys know that book? And a, you know, Vow of Poverty, and I decided to take a vow of poverty. And uh, which of course lasted like a week when you're a kid, right? Uh, but, um, but it really changed my life. And so I sort of decided that that was the way I was gonna start to work. I was gonna start to go to the community and let the community tell me how I needed to work and how I needed to do my stuff. So um, I have a process. I am a, a little bit of a fuss budget about this kind of stuff. I have a little desk at home, one of those IKEA desks. It's very, very clean. It's my spiritual space. Nothing's on it but a pen and some paper, right? I got to be ready to go to work when I'm ready when the muse hits. And the other thing is I have this gigantic sort of vision board behind me. And when I start to think or read or get uh, pregnant with the possibility of a play, as I say, I just start to take it all in, and it all shows up on that board, right? And then fabrics and, and pictures and characters and all that stuff. And when that board is full, I'm kind of pretty much ready to write the play. This is always on the board, and I thought I would read it to you because it's been essential, especially in the adaptation of the Greeks. Nothing is original. Steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and shadows. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent. 
And don't bother concealing your thievery. Celebrate it if you feel like it. In any case, always remember what Jean-Luc Godard said. It's not where you take things from, it's where you take things to. And this is uh, Jim Jarmusch, the famous filmmaker. Um, I think this was really, really important for me because, you know, the Greek classics, my God, right? Uh, how dare I, right? How many times after a play reading has somebody come up and said, how dare you, right? And so then you kind of have to go like, okay, we relax, we're going to get there, right? It's a process. And so um, this is the way it started, and it started in a very interesting way. Tucson, Arizona. I, uh, every time I go and work at a theater and I do a play, I also do what I call my service work, uh, um, what I call an ofrenda, an offering. And I go, and so in Tucson, I was working with teen felons in a youth authority program, and I met a 13-year-old girl who had murdered her mother. She had murdered her mother because the mother had put a hit out on the dad, who was a drug dealer from the south side of Tucson, Yaqui Indian. Um, I wish you could have met her because she had the most angelic and beautiful face, and she was a great poet. But the story was very, very disturbing, and as we went along the weeks in the program, it, it just got more and more disturbing as the details unfolded. So uh, after that revelation that night, I went to the Arizona Theater Company, and I remember I wanted to see something funny, and I saw a play called The Mystery of Irma Vep. Yeah, and a ridiculous theater company, right? And I, uh, and I walked into the Arizona Theater uh, Bookstore, and they had a collection of the Greeks, right? Ten Greeks for $10, a dollar Greek, pretty good. And um, I had not read the Greeks, and the first play I read was Electra, the story of a young girl who murders her mother to avenge her father's death. What? Oh, my God, right? Where am I going with this, right? What, what happened? How did I this story come to me, and how did this ancient tale come to me, and how do I tell my students, how do I tell my community, how do I bring both of those things together? And my initial impulse was just, just to tell that story beat per beat in a modern setting. So I wrote a play called Electricidad and about girl gangs in LA, and uh, there is a young girl in the front yard of her house in Boyle Heights, and she is chained up to her father's body and she is going to protect her father against this really evil woman named Clemencia. And so she has a sister, La Ifi, Iphigenia, born again Chola, who's uh, come back. And so I've started to just trace, if I could be per beat, the tales of that story. Um, I have to say that it started very, very rough. So I thought tonight, rather than just me talk, 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 because I think I'll bore you to death, I have a lot of images. So I thought, let's look at some images, we'll talk. Um, I wrote this very academic paper earlier, and I thought, who am I? I had a suit also. I thought, let's, let's let that go. So tonight, uh, testimony, let's just talk, right? So it starts off a little ragged, a little rough, but I think you'll get a sense of how I work. So this is the production of Electricidad, where it started in Tucson, Arizona. Most of the people in this picture have nothing to do with theater, which is I, something I love. I love working with amateur theater companies. So a lot of these folks, uh, uh, Rosanna up in the corner, head librarian for the city of Tucson. Um, this woman down below had a fish shop for a while. That was Albert, who worked for the Pima Arts Council. So really, it was folks, I didn't need actors. What I needed was people to tell me, this is the way we talk. We would never say this. We would never kill the mother. You know, like they had like great dramaturgy and logic attached to the story, right? So I really listened to the community and we started there in Tucson at um, uh, Pima Community College. Uh, I love these kind of community colleges productions because, you know, Tucson, if you've ever been, has this wonderful natural uh, this, uh, landscape. And I said, why don't we just take rocks from the outside and bring them in? And of course, all the rocks there are fake. But, you know, God bless them. <laughs> so I run from this immediately to a, a kind of almost a million dollar production at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. So that's how crazy this journey of this play has been. It's on its 42nd production, believe it or not. And uh, it gets performed a lot in the American Southwest because it's in Spanglish. So I speak English, I use some Spanish. I'm really playing with both cultures there. This actress, her name is um, Cecilia Suarez. And if anybody's been watching the Netflix show La, La Casa de las Flores, she's the lead and she's fantastic. Um, so, chained up to the father's body, this has now been designed in this gigantic 
theater uh, with two tons of white sand and rain, it's crazy, and a great chorus of Las Vecinas, the neighbors who gossip. They sweep and gossip. And they really are the voice of the people of Pilsen in Chicago. Um, the actress at the top, her name is Yvonne Cole. She's the grandmother on uh, Jane the Virgin, if you ever watched that show. And Yvonne kind of walked away with this production. Uh, there's the two tons of sand. <laughs> Orestes and Electricidad. So I'm really now playing with a lot of images of culture, community, incarceration, who these people are, sharing the joint, you know. If a Janaya shows up, I know she's gone, but she shows up in this production. She's born again, and she's kind of great. Um, so I like uh, using visual images, or I like asking questions before I do a play. And this popped up, it's called La Butterfly, because she has a tattoo of a butterfly. And it's an actual woman who came to opening night in Los Angeles at that production. And I thought, this is electricidad. She looks almost Greek to me. The high hair, like the mask, you know, the, the, the shoes we gave her, almost everything about it. She's wearing a mask, and that is something about gang culture, especially with women. The eyes, all of that, that really kept me in the kind of like frame of, um, of how to write this play and stay true to the classic. It became our poster. This is the Los Angeles Smart Tape Reform production. So we started to really play with Greek images. That's when Mary joined us. Um, and then I use a lot of like veteran actors in my community. This is Alma Martinez, a veteran of the Teatro Campesino, the 50-year-old company up in San Juan Bautista. How do I translate this to the community? How do I translate this story and this language? And I really did stay beat per beat. It's an hour and a half. And one of the things that I do with the Greeks is everything you hear off stage, I make happen on stage, right? You see the action happening. The other thing I should say before we go on is that I think of these as love stories. So electricidad is a familial a love story, right? Between daughter and father. Oedipus El Rey is the story uh, of two lovers. And um, obviously they can't be together. But you know, one of the challenges of that play is that you watch a 16 minute sequence two naked people on stage who have just made love, a mother and her son, and they're talking about what their future might be. And somehow my goal in that production was to get you to want them to be together so bad because they are two wounded souls in the world and they can't, right? And so I really do think of these as love stories, Hassan, Jason, and Medea. That for me, they're all love stories. Even though they're embedded with a lot of violence and a lot of culture, I think that ultimately, um, one of the things we don't talk about enough in our community is our bodies and our sexuality. You see us always in acts of violence, but how do I couple the violence of a play like this with the joy of, of, of bodies, especially female bodies? Um, this is a San Jose uh, production with Adelina Anthony, Dina Martinez. One of the things I loved about this production is the woman on the end there is Carla Pantoja. She's a well-known fight director, one of the few female fight directors in the regional theaters. And so, uh, you know, uh, thinking about how we, we create violence on stage was very, very interesting. Uh, New Mexico Arts Festival, a Marin Theater Company. So I thought I'd just take you down my little, I'm kind of enjoying this because I'm taking you down my little memory lane. Um, Images, the images we use in our culture, right? The Greek chorus, once again. This was a really interesting production. It took place in the old Los Angeles City Jail in an actual jail cell, which was, oh my God, could you get a metaphor on top of a metaphor, right? Um, this is a very interesting production also for me because this gentleman right here, his name is Tom Sandoval, uh, had not acted before. He was a Vietnam veteran who uh, I met at the VA hospital doing service work, and he told me that he was, had a lot of PTSD, and that he, he was looking for a hobby, and I said, oh, you should come and be in my play. I don't know why I offered him, but he was extraordinary, and now he's in everybody's plays. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth production. 
And they're all completely different. It's very interesting. This one really freaked me out, I have to say. It's the Los Angeles County High School of the Performing Arts. It's high school kids. How strange, right? And maybe one of my favorite productions so far, Cal State University Northridge, a deaf Medea. I mean, a deaf um, Electra. And what was extraordinary about it was I arrived, nobody told me, and I sat down, and I was looking on the set, once she started to sign, where my text was gonna be, and they didn't use any of my text. <laughs> I worked really hard on that play. But then I kind of completely got into it. I completely believed that she was doing my text. She was com completely immersed in, in the character and in the body, and from the other characters talking, you could get exactly what was going on. So, uh, Electra, right? I go in this world, I think, wow, this is amazing. People kind of like this, and if they don't like it, it's getting a lot of people talking, right? And um, people are having really sort of intense reactions. A lot of people are, um, the classicists are very mad at me, and I'm sort of enjoying the conversation we're having about how to bring that into the to contemporary audiences. And then the, the, the modern folks are always like, why are you paying so much attention to the, the original text? You know, so there was a lot of that kind of fight. But I kind of liked it. And so, you know, you start with something and you get better and better at it. So this is the second part for me. I um, started with the image. I had an image of a young homeboy with a tattoo of a crown on his back. And this was at the Magic Theater in San Francisco, if you guys know that space. It's a very storied, hollow space, I think, because um, it's uh, the home of Sam Shepard and early um, uh, David Mamet. And so we, we started working on the production. We had very little money. And I had an image that, you know when you Florida hurricanes happen, they have that wood that, that everybody buys for their windows? I said, we should put that wood on the floor, treat it use automotive lights, that's it. And the director was like, I love it. Let's see if we can make it work. And so we started to just, those are automotive lights in the back. And we started to, to play with the Oedipus Smith. And um, I had had one experience at the Getty Villa where I, I came every day um, with actors and I had no play. And every day I wrote a scene a day, sometimes two scenes, till I wrote a kind of basic first draft. So I'm really, really like gung-ho in it if I have actors there, it's just a tremendous amount of pressure, and I love it. So I wrote a play kind of in a week and a half. And, um, and you know, they gave us free lunch, so that also kept me there. And um, it was really kind of an amazing experience. So we started this experience at The Magic. This is an actor who had just graduated from DePaul uh, University in Chicago. Um, and love working a lot with um, young actors. So the question, that, uh, that really arose for me out of this was I read a piece of information that said that the state of California has a 52% recidivism rate, return to prison rate, for 17 to 24 year old men. Whoa, so what is it? And some guys go back within hours. So what is it that is making you go back there? Is this where the new kingdoms are? So I went back and started reading Oedipus and I started to trace those beats, right? So the young king, and you start to see this story unfold. This was the Boston Court production at Jessica's Theater. Um, we started playing with the prison metaphor. And I tried to stay, once again, beat per beat in the original text, Tiresias, Oedipus, and build a narrative. And then I went to uh, Woolly Mammoth Theater in Washington, DC. Uh, and um, I love, this was the poster for the play, it's Quien es este hombre, who is this man? So I, I, we started to go back a little bit more to the classic text and rework it. So one of the things that's always joyful about these different kinds of productions is that uh, one of the things that I do as an artist, because I do these long-term residencies, I stay for so long that I actually write the play again, kinda, uh, which is that I reset the play in the community that I'm in. So I reset the play. I worked with a guy named Misha Kaufman, who is an amazing set designer, Eastern European. That's all, well, that's why you see all the black. And he said to me, um, that was a joke. And he said to me, uh, uh, what's your favorite TV show? And I love it when designers ask me que crazy questions. And at, I don't have a TV anymore, but at the time my favorite show was called um, America's Next Top Model. And so I said America's Next Top Model. And you know what he did? He gutted the theater, because it's usually a proscenium, and he added a, a ramp, a runway. And so uh, never tell them your favorite TV show, because uh, we ended up with the runway show. And uh, a much more violent production 
I think that I wanted. Um, I usually, and I have to say this, and it'll be an interesting conversation to have later, I usually work with female directors, and this is one of the few times where I worked with a male director who was really like macho, and everything was about the violence. And it was a kind of jarring for me, I have to say, a very bloody. Um, so you could see the ramp and just what they were doing with it. Um, Uh, the infamous, you know, what I call the road rage scene, right? The middle of the road. So that was the design, and this was the way it kind of played out. And it played out so violently and so bloody that all the people in the front rows got bloodied. And uh, so, of course, there's a guy named um, Peter Marks, the famous Washington Post critic, who got bloodied. And uh, he didn't like it. So, you know, not every review can be the best review ever, right? Um, so the thing that happened that was also kind of powerful during this time was that there's a guy named Father Greg Boyle. I don't know if you've heard of an organization called Homeboy Industries, which uh, does rehabilitation for gang members. Now, it's an extraordinary $50 million organization that does something really interesting, which that they don't just try to get you off the streets. They do mental health services, tattoo removal, lots of things we don't really think about. And they have a number of industries, and you might see them at the airport because they they sell chips and salsa, they sell t-shirts, they have bakery. So, you know, they've got a, the guys work in a lot of this stuff. So Father Greg saw uh, one of the productions of Oedipus, and he questioned the authenticity, bless him. He is a priest, after all. And uh, he said, um, I think you should meet somebody. So this is a very quick story about probably where I shifted in my Greek writing. Uh, I met a guy who had just gotten out of prison, 16 years, in something called the SHU, Solitary Holding Unit, right? Uh, he had gone into prison. He was from a gang in Wilmington, California, Wilma's gang, and his brother was going to be killed by, shot by a, a rival gang, and they said, we won't kill your brother if you kill somebody. So he was 16 years old at the time, and he went up to a bus stop on a corner and shot an old lady who was waiting for the bus in the head. I hate this guy. I really hate this guy. And he walks in, and he's bald, and he's completely tattooed all over his body. He's completely tattooed. He's terrifying, and he won't look at me. And later I found out I was the first person that he had talked to. So he has been in the solitary holding unit, and the only one other person uh, that he was in communication with was the guard who watched him. So he comes in, the entire interview, he never looks at me. So I'm telling him, you know, tell me the story, and he's telling me the story about what's happened, and he says, I'm very, very angry, because when I was in prison, my mother died, and they didn't let me go see her, um, and uh, lots of family members were, you know, in altercations and stuff, and I just didn't know any of that, and, uh, and the guard uh, kept trying to talk to me about Jesus. So the guard uh, was kind of like a father figure for this guy, and he says that the guard says to him one day, when you get out, I'm going to retire and I'm going to walk out of this prison with you, which is extraordinary. And, uh, and he said, uh, and it happened. So they let you know about a week before you get out. They try not to let you know too far in advance so you don't get in trouble. You'll get $200 in cash. You get a bus ticket back to where you came from, which is a terrible idea, right? And you get a new pair of uh, New Balance tennis shoes. Uh, and you get some um, uh, SRO housing uh, vouchers. So you don't get a whole lot, right? But you get a chance to start again. And he says, I'm walking out, and I see the guard. And I had never not seen him in his uniform. And he goes, and I started to walk out of there. And he came up to me, and he wanted to shake my hand. And I realized I had not touched somebody in 16 years. He goes, I also need to tell you that I don't know the touch of a woman. And the whole time he's telling me, he's like this. So I'm like, oh my God, if this guy looks at me, I'm just going to freak out, right? It was really, really intense. And he goes, so the guard said, um, I want to give you a gift. I want to hug you. And he said, I said no to him. And he goes, but he did it anyway. And he hugged me. And it was the first time that I remember crying in my life. I did not have a mother figure. I only had a father in my life. So I did not know what it meant to be, um, to be soft, I think is what he said. 
And uh, so the guard held on to him. He says, we held on to each other for about 30 to 45 minutes. And I wept. And it was in that moment that I realized that I knew a word. And the word was redemption. And that I would never come back here again. How extraordinary is that, right? And um, so I'm sitting in this tiny little room with no windows, with this guy who's just gotten out of prison after 16 years. And I said, do you know the story of Oedipus? And, well, I was nervous. And, uh, and he said, uh, no. And so then I told him the whole myth. And he said, wow. I said, I think you're my Oedipus. I think that you're my way through the authentic story into this play. Would you be my Oedipus? And he said, yes. And he's a speaker at Homeboy Industries. He's never gone back to prison. Uh, and, and it's just one of the most amazing stories. I think this is a good example of what it means to be in community and to be an artist and to bring both of your, your worlds together into an artwork, yeah? And it allow them to express themselves in this way, to take the ancient and to take the modern and to let them crash into each other and to see ourselves, especially my community, to see ourselves in the world to imagine ourselves outside of our barrios, outside of our neighborhoods, to become part of the larger humanity, part of this bigger, bigger community that is us, right? So it started to change everything I did, and then I went back to rewriting. So in Washington, D.C., I am doing a program on literacy. And I'm just gonna quickly show you these people. These are my glasses. I, I get people to wear these glasses. It's called my rock star glasses, because personalities emerge. So take a look. Yeah, people's personalities emerge. So every single one of these people could not read or write. And uh, they, I went to the Y every day for a year to meet them. And the first thing they, they read was this play of mine, Oedipus El Rey. And the thing that was most extraordinary was this first woman. So my first class, I was nervous as hell. Um, I knew that there was a lot of, a lot of tension in the room. And um, this woman, I walk in, I said, I'm going to present a paper about a play I've written called Oedipus El Rey. You know, and I'm speaking slowly. I don't know why. And um, she says, okay, and forgive my French. She says, uh, fucking your mother? Really? <laughs> and I went, okay, okay. So I took a step back and I said, how many of you are here in this literacy program because you woke up one day and you said to yourself, enough. I need to learn how to read and write. How many of you got the will and the energy to come every Tuesday night and will yourself to be here? How many of you made that happen? And all the hands went up. How many of you think that God did this? That you're a puppet in a play that has already been written? That this is not of your own device? But you are here because history has already willed that moment to happen. God made this happen. And all the hands went up. And I went, you can only choose one. And we started the investigation of Oedipus, right? And it turned into this fantastic community exploration. They came to every single rehearsal. They came to opening night. They went to design meetings. They were very opinionated. They were very, very fun. And, and I learned a ton about how to include community. So I now have community dramaturgs, right? Community dramaturgs are sometimes way smarter than regular dramaturgs, because they catch all the logics. And this is a production in Tucson, Arizona that happened. This is the production in Chicago, Illinois, that was very profound for me, because um, I did another crazy community project. Um, let me put it on a section where you can see some. So uh, I had 32 performances of the play, and I went to 32 nonprofits Every day, I would go to a nonprofit in the morning to visit them. And that night, I would invite the, uh, the executive director to meet me on stage after the show and talk to the audience. Whew, right? So 32 trips on, how many of you are from Chicago or know Chicago? OK, so the Kedzie line, the pink line, to the end of the line, then a bus to the end of the bus line, and then walk 12 blocks, summer heat, you know, 90 degrees, sweating like crazy, and you show up at some place where there are a bunch of 20-year-old guys who have just gotten out of prison, and you're, you want to have conversations about theater, right? And it was the most amazing experience, but every night somebody would come and join me on stage. 
I had the most amazing, incredible responses because a lot of them, um, mothers of, of young men who had been in prison, but I also had this crazy audience. Chicago audiences are very vocal. They, they don't have a problem telling you what they think. So I had a guy who came one night and he stood, uh, after the show, he raised his hand and he said, I'm very disgusted with you. What a terrible idea for a play. You're a pervert. And I said, well, actually, I didn't write it. It's a guy named Sophocles. And he goes, is he here? Because I want to talk to him right now. <laughs> it's brilliant, right? And then I had a woman who wanted to know why we don't have corporal punishment. And she was a, a kindergarten teacher. I was like, oh, my God. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe my favorite was listening to people talk about their own experiences of losing family when they were, when they were in prison. That was maybe the hardest thing um, because the mothers were so, so you know, hurt by this play in a way. The play brought back so many memories. So I had this one wonderful experience during the preview where I had these two old people. They had said to me, they knew the Greeks, and they were sitting there, and the husband leans into the wife, and he says, I think that's his mother. And she says, no. And then they go on, and she goes, no, I think that's his mother. No. And then I get to that 16-minute love scene, right? And she goes, oh, my God, let's go. And they left. Uh, so some audiences could really deal with it, and others couldn't. So it's interesting to me when I write these plays for the stage because I am... Um, I, you know, I, I want to represent the violence the way it should really be represented, but I also think that the body is important. So my plays kind of go like this. This is the way I talk about them. They go, they stop for a general amount of time for something beautiful to happen in terms of bodies, and then they go back to their violent actions, right? That 16 minute scares the hell out of people, but why does the violence not? What is that about? To see an older woman's body on stage is terrifying for some. And you know what was heartbreaking is those nights when like 20 people would leave at the sight of, of a woman's body. I just, thought, I just thought it was amazing. So I learned so much in that, in that moment. The other thing I learned is how to diversify the American theater. So uh, Victory Gardens Theater in Chicago, a great theater, uh, mostly like 60-year-olds and up, mostly white audience. And at the first, after opening, I was like, oh my god, what am I going to do, right? Like, I got to get my people in here. So I went out after the first you know, performance, and I said, listen, if we want to diversify the American theater, we can do it right now. I'm going to ask you to give me $10 and I'm gonna take that $10 down to the box office and I'm gonna buy a ticket for a kid. I'm gonna to go to a, a, high, a junior high school or a high school in town and we're just gonna to get tons of kids in here. Will you join me in that? And I had the cutest guy in the cast uh, with a bucket and he stood at the end and the first night I made about $1,400. I made, I think over $10,000 in ticket sales for young people. Overnight, the theater was diversified. Overnight, it went across all ages, across all colors, and it went across, really, the culture of the city. The South met the North. And if you know Chicago, never the two shall meet, right? Those two communities meeting each other in the theater. And the rule was, you can't sit with your group. You have to sit with everybody else wherever the seat is. And you were going to learn how to be in the theater together. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and I'm so grateful for it. My other little inside story is this is an amazing actor named Adam Poss. He's on Chicago Fire or MP, he's won one of those Chicago shows, right? And he, um, he came in, and I had seen him in a bunch of Indian plays by Rajiv Joseph, who's an amazing Indian writer. And I, I went up to him, and I learned a big lesson myself, because I said, I, don't, I can't have you audition. I'm really trying to go for something very authentic, and I need a Latino. And he goes, I'm, I've actually never played a Latino, but I am one. And I go, oh my god, I've only seen you in Indian plays. He goes, I did accent work in college. <laughs> And so uh, I started a great relationship with this great actor and have written a number of things for him in Chicago. And it's, it's been really, really amazing. Um, OK, so that's Chicago. Yes. So here's my sort of tragic story about Chicago. One of my stops, one of my 32 stops, I meet this guy. He just got out of prison two nights before he came to see my play. And uh, he comes to see the play. He's just so full of joy and soul and so happy to be out of prison. And at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a call and he had been shot and killed. The reality of how immediate these stories are and how they live inside of us 
in that sort of immediacy, how we bring the story to the community, but it's happening in that moment. There is no time to waste. Really kind of lit a fire under me in terms of how I wanted to keep writing these. So this is a, a Portland, a Milagro Theater in Portland, their production. Um, this is Minneapolis in a warehouse. The great playwright Carlisle Brown, who graced me with being my Tiresias. It was an Indian and an African-American actor. This is uh, Seattle, uh, an amateur theater company called Su Teatro. Uh, Dallas Theater Center, which Melinda saw, right? This is the production. And then San Diego Rep, here in San Diego, they did a really beautiful production. This is Joaquin Valdez, the son of the famous teatrista, Luis Valdez, who gave a zoot suit in La Bamba. This is his son. And uh, a really beautiful production, very operatic. And then the most recent production at the Public Theater last year. Um, I was very proud of this production. We, we sold out before we even started rehearsing, and we extended it three times. And we got a critic's pick in the New York Times, and the membership was livid because I made the artistic director, Oscar Eustace, at the Public Theater do something he'd never done. I made him reserve 30% of the tickets for people who show up to buy their ticket that night because we know that we are event people. People of color do not buy in advance. They like don't trust you. So they show up and want a ticket. And so we had 30% of the house every night sold out just on people, it's this humongous line. So um, this production directed by Che Yu, a longtime colleague of mine. This is a Sphinx, and my production is a Sphinx. Oedipus blinds himself. That mural is a famous mural by East LA muralist, and I called him in LA and I said, can you let me copy that mural? And he said, absolutely. And we had it like, I don't know, like $500 to offer him. And he refused to take money, and I, had a, I found a, a, a graffiti artist in New York who recreated it on stage. This wonderful young actor uh, who just came in an audition, and I knew he was my Oedipus right at the beginning, just won a special uh, uh, Broadway World Award for the kind of incredible season he's having. He was just a joy to work with. Um, really locating the violence of this play was key in New York. So here's my politics attached to even a public theater production. This is called The Soul Project. It's a group of theater artists who have done something kind of radical. They have decided that they're gonna um, nicely encourage I'm trying to think of all the good words, rather than terrorize all the local New York theaters to do 12 productions of 12 Latino plays in the course of the next 10 years. And so uh, they went to Oscar, and Oscar said, I would love to do it, but I don't have the money. So believe it or not, I have never done this before because I don't have a problem raising money, but I don't like to go to like people who I, uh, other artists to raise money. And I called Lynn Miranda from Hamilton. And he connected me to a guy in Washington, D.C., a lawyer who funded the entire production. And that's how it was done. That's how it was created. And he's funding my Medea next season. And so he said to Oscar in that wonderful, you know, very mafia way, he said, I'll fund Oedipus this season if you also agree to do Medea next season. And Oscar was like, you know, we don't know what our season. And he was like, well, then I can't do it. And Oscar was like, OK. <laughs> So that's the only reason why I have two productions in New York off-Broadway in successive seasons, which is rare. Uh, and if you're in New York, uh, New York in San Francisco, May through June, uh, believe it or not, we're doing a 10-year anniversary production of Oedipus. It's been 10 years. Yikes. It goes fast when you're having fun, right? So finally, I'd like to take you to my Badia. I started, and I, I don't know of anybody who is more, uh, I don't know, s and -E than I, because I wrote two Medeas. <laughs> what was I thinking? The first one was called Bruja, my sorceress, witch, right? And I went down to an area of uh, the Bay Area called the Daily City, and I hung out with day workers, and I met all the curandera, the, the women who do, um, you know, healing work. 
And, um, and we had hardly any money, once again, for a set, so we went and bought all this reclaimed wood. And all the tile work that you see on the floor was all actually white from um, Home Depot. And then we had a craft day where we painted them. So, you know, it looks kind of nice, right, for a, a low-budget production. And um, I started to write a Medea who is a sorceress. Um, and I liked it, and the play got, you know, very good reviews. I started to um, explore elements of my own family, but the banana tree from Michoacan, the southern part of Mexico. She speaks the old ancient language, Nahuatl, right? Um, so I'm really starting to merge my Latino myth into the Greek myth and see where the two collide, right? And so I start to play with all these elements and I've been working with this actress since she was a child. Her mother is a famous uh, MacArthur fellow with me. Her name is Maria Varela, who's a land and water rights activist in, who works on the uh, reservations in New Mexico. And she, when, many years ago, she said, this is my daughter, and she was eight at the time. She wants to be an actress. And I was like, oh, good luck, <laughs> right? And then, sure enough, she did Electricidad at the New, Mex New Mexico Arts Festival. She then started doing all my plays. And so it's been a great journey to build this play with this actor. So here are all the elements of the play. What I really, really loved about it, even though I didn't think it was finished, was this last scene, you know, taking off in the chariot, right? And of course, there's not enough money for a chariot. But we do have this wood st uh, staircase. And what I loved about it is the banana leaves become the talons that become the wings that she takes off in. But you know what? Site-specific, location, location, location. Guess what happens? Magic Theater, does anybody know the Magic Theater in San Francisco? It's on Fort Mason at the water, at the, in, in the marina, in the very end of San Francisco, right, right in front of the water. And when you open that door, she would bust it open every night, and guess what she was looking at? Alcatraz. Entrapped forever, right? The audience was kind of gasped. And thank God Alcatraz was there, like I didn't have to pay for it, so it was amazing. <laughs> and then I went back to do another production in Tucson with an actual curandera, a woman who actually did healing work, and she really helped me a lot. Uh, the production was, you know, I, you know, the critics really took to it, like, in a bad way. But I thought that what I learned was how to be authentic in all the herbs and all the spells and all of that stuff. So I go back to Chicago, uh, another one of my creative homes, and I decide, with, along with the artistic director, Victor Gardens, who said, I think you need to rewrite that Medea. And I went, oh my god, oh my god, no, no. I'm depressed, no. And he said, yes, you need to go back to the streets of Chicago. So I went to Pilsen, which is the Mexican neighborhood of Chicago, started talking to dreamers, the un undocumented people who, uh, on the streets who are helping other people uh, with just very basic services, like where to, where to get checks, where to bank, where, like how to just live as an undocumented person in the city. And people started telling me stories, and I started to do story circles, where I just invite people in the newspaper or on the radio, I would invite people to come and join me in a little circle, and I put 10 chairs. Sometimes two people came, sometimes 10 people came, and then I started doing town halls, and then I would do one-to-ones, where I would say, can I meet you, because I want to know about housing or whatever. Tons of people in Chicago stepped forward, and we started this journey of writing a Medea with Mary's help, because Mary told me a few things, and I really started to imagine what this Medea could be, which is, she's an immigrant, right? In a land that's not her own. And Mary said to see a, a YouTube from the 1950s of, of Dame Judith Anderson, and she's surrounded by all these, and it's that kind of like, kind of acting, you know, is brilliant. And uh, to all these women, this Greek chorus is standing around her, and they say, look at her soiling our land. And I thought, oh my God, this is an immigrant tale. I am going to track Medea's journey to the U.S. in the same way the Medea's journey gets tracked. I'm going to do the, all the same type of beats and see if I can sort of match them up. And as I was doing this, I met a woman on the streets who told me a harrowing tale of what happened to her when she crossed into the US that involved a, a violent rape and it involved um, being in, in a truck and not being able to breathe. And what happens is Medea, my Medea, comes to this country and she can't leave her house because she's, um, she's suffered so much physical trauma that really what's driving the story is this a love that's being pulled apart from her husband who is assimilating very quickly 
right? So I, want, I love this image because I want to very quickly tell you the story about this actress. So I had a, a love scene, a really hot love scene in my play where um, Medea says to her husband, let's make love outside like we used to do back on the farm. And he says, here? Oh, my God, like the neighbors. And she goes, no, let's do it. Let's sanctify this land. Let's make love. And he says, you really want to do it? And so in my original writing of this, it was like a really hot, like, you know, Anne Rice love scene, right? And um, what happened is the actress started to get a rash. And we couldn't figure it out. So we had to do um, take samples of the paint and go test them. We tested the air conditioning system. And she had just this little white dress, very simple. And then she started wearing these leggings because her the rash was really starting to happen. And then she started wearing that sweater. And I thought, oh my god, how stupid I've been. There's no way that she could be making love to her husband after going through that experience in the desert where she was gang raped by these soldiers. There's no way. And what's tearing them apart is that she cannot connect with him, both spiritually and physically. She can't. He's on his American dream. And you're watching their child, who used to wear little huaraches and who had a soccer jersey. All of a sudden, he's like in skater outfits. And you know he's shifting. He's assimilating very quickly into the culture. So that's really what happens is that this woman becomes a bit of an agoraphobic person. And she sews in her backyard. That's how she makes her money, under the table. And Chicago and Los Angeles have the two uh, most illegal uh, garment districts in the country because people are paid under the table. The only thing you need to do is sew that label in a factory. But she can make an entire Macy's dress, but the label gets sewn in a factory. So that dress gets sold for $200. You know how much she makes on that dress? $750. Wow. So, you know, my research gets better and better as I start to research these stories, right? So here's this tale of this family and their crossing. And the actress was so, so helpful because she started to show me what was acceptable and what was not. And I really started to write through character once again. So the other thing I do a lot is I love working with designers. I saw this uh, house in Pilsen. I took a picture of it and I told the designer, I think this is the house. And she was like, okay, let me recreate it. She recreated it on stage. That was our first sort of pass on stage, and it became this. So we started to add all this Chicago texture, right? And, um, and then it become, became this. And so you start to watch her more and more get more and more isolated until what happens tragically at the end of this play. So in uh, San Francisco, it was a world of men and one woman. And in Chicago, it's a world of women and that one prized boy. Yeah. So this is my Creon. Her name is Armida. She's a developer of apartments. She came here 30 years ago from the same town in Mexico. But she has figured out how to be in the system. So you see generations of these women um, working with each other. Uh, the other thing I learned that was really, really exciting. Somebody keep track of my time because I'm just like having a great time here. I feel like I'm like at my slumber party. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing that happened that was really, really extraordinary here was um, I had written uh, the, the scene where she kills her son, Hassan, I mean her son Akat. And she, we had this sort of violent ending where the boy comes home and he, uh, he's being really snotty. And she gets the machete that she uses to cut down the banana leaves and she starts chasing him around. And the audience was like, oh my God, this is so disturbing. But they weren't really affected. So the second night of the preview, I write a scene where she says, um, do you want to go live with her? Meaning Armida, the other mother, right? And he says... And she says, okay, go get your stuff. And the actor, the little boy, he was wonderful. He just walks up the stairs all the way to the top. And she's going to leave. She's decided that she's finally going to leave. And she goes over and she sees the machete. And she walks very slowly, very, very slowly, very methodically up those stairs. Oh, my God. The audience was like screaming at her. And people were, women were weeping and saying, stop, don't, don't. People were going bonkers, and some woman runs to the edge of the stage and says, ah, and something like, devil, I can stop, you know, they were screaming, and I'm like, holy 
stuff in her. And the poor actress, I mean, she, she dealt with it very well. But, you know, the tension of that kind of scene was so, so horrendous. And the, cha and the play keeps changing because with Jessica, we had a whole other ending. So I'm trying to figure out these endings. And this was Jessica's production. The only little story I have to tell you was this was our beautiful um, advertisement. It's actually a wood cut uh, wood block, a wood cutting of the two actors that were actually in the play. Now we had a poster that said Mojada, and if you guys know what Mojada is, it's wetback. It's a derogatory term that was coined in the 1930s for people who crossed over the Rio Grande River into the US, undocumented. And so um, the company that puts up all of these, uh, these uh, banners on the sides of the streets in Los Angeles is a very conservative company, and they were not going to put a nasty word in Spanish up. So um, I'm so proud of the people at the Getty who figured out that if you make it part of the art and build it into the woodblock, they had no choice. And that's the way we got it up there. And then we had to think of a subtitle. And that's where Amadea in Los Angeles ended up being. It looks like the title of the play, doesn't it? It's actually Mojada. A very different production, Outdoors. And if, has anybody been to the Getty Villa outdoors to see? It's really extraordinary, an extraordinary experience. One of the things that's amazing is that the, the, there's a museum during the day, so you can't have your set out there. So you bring your set out every night. So we actually had a house that we designed from East LA that was rolled out every night. And everything had to sort of be rolled out. This little boy was our, our wonderful young child actor, and he, uh, he's, he was the voice of Coco, the little boy in Coco, and so he won't return my calls. That's all I want to say about him. <laughs> <laughs> That's our set. Uh, summer heat rehearsals. Uh, and then this is the production at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So I just keep going, right? I'm writing it for every community that I'm at. A house that's like lifted from its ground. You can see all the stuff underneath. Uh, I'm interesting because, you know, I'm so used to 32 performances in a regional theater. And, um, at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, we do 124 performances. So those actors have to re have real endurance. But luckily, I'm working with Shakespearean actors, so they're used to doing, you know, 140 production and performances of a hardcore three-hour, three, four-hour Shakespeare. So this almost seemed like, you know, small to them, an hour and a half show. And this was our model, and this was our actual set. Amazing, huh? Uh, the famous scene with uh, you know, the, the gift. In my version, it's uh, these snakes that start to uh, encircle her, and they start to squeeze her. Uh, community, just very quickly, this is a group called Uno from Portland. They are community leaders throughout, uh, throughout the state of um, Oregon. And they came. They have nothing to do with art. And uh, they're like hospitality. Uh, they work in education. They work in politics. They work in hotels. And they came. And they were my community dramaturgs. And they were amazing. They had a ton of questions. And they didn't buy the play. And the best thing was this woman didn't buy the play. And she told me it was a waste of human energy. And we had a very long talk about what art is. And we started to talk about expression, and she started to weep and cry. And we had this very intense week where we saw Shakespeare plays, my play, and we kept talking about art. And at the end, she laughed. I didn't hear from her, and she just got her MFA in creative writing. <laughs> so they come around, don't they? Finally, I wanted to end with this image, because this is my six years. I'm just finishing up my sixth season, 10 years at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, an 83-year-old uh, uh, theater. I, I'm, the only, I'm the first and only playwright in residence. Thank God Shakespeare's dead. I got to do it. And, um, and the thing that was really extraordinary about my time there was how I was able to diversify the theater. So this was our beginning of the season. And one of the things I love about this poster is Julius Caesar is Armando Duran. Mojada is Sabina, right? Zuniga, Varela. Daniel Morinla is um, Henry. And uh, what's her name? Janine. Um, oh, God, I always forget her name. Jamie Ann Romero was the lead in Shakespeare in Love. So the first four plays in our season are anchored by Latino actors. Nobody said a single thing about it. Everybody accepted it. That's true diversity in the theater, right? that you can do a Shakespeare, that you can do a play that speaks to you in community, that you can talk to each other through a larger means and language. 
So um, thank you so much. There's so much more I could have said, but I am so grateful to be here. Um, I feel like the, like the, the, the comedy act. I'll be outside afterwards for a drink, so let's meet there afterwards. Thank you all for being here. I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Oh, if, if anybody has a, a question, I forgot there's questions. If anybody has a question, feel free to jump on in. Anybody have a question? Anybody have a feeling? Anybody terrified to be here? The drinking starts in half an hour, so we could... Um, Uh, yeah, here's a woman right here with the question right there. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a mic. Well, we'll just be real nice and loud. Um, so I really like the way you use the choruses in Oedipus and uh, Electricidad. Why do you not use one in your Medeas? So I have a one-person chorus. It's the old lady. It's Tita. And she is the voice of the community. So she's the one who speaks to the community. I wanted to try a one-person chorus because I thought, um, well, you know, money. But I also wanted to see how, how it worked to have one character who spoke for them. And I love the, the idea of the chorus. And I also was playing with a lot with the Mexican coro tradition, which is a very oral storytelling, poetry, language, rhythm. And so although the Spanish might seem like it's just kind of free form flying, it's actually very, very carefully constructed. So, I'm, so with her, I was able to really play with rhythm and language and how she spoke to the audience. And she gets the majority of the monologues. Mm -hmm. So she's really telling them her, their story, yeah. Thank you, that's a good Thank question, you. yes. Yes, right there, just stand up, speak it loud, sister. Yes. I noticed that in the earlier earlier production of Electricidad, you, the Las Vecinas had a mask, or kind of like a demi yes. mask. But it seems like you let go of that. Is there a reason why? Or can you tell a little bit more about whether you've experimented with masks? That's a really fantastic. So Henry Godinez, who is the, one of the resident artists at the Goodman, is a traditionalist and uh, does classical text a lot. And he really wanted to stay true to the classical text. I found for myself as a writer, that I read the Greek, I study it, I have meetings with Mary, and then I kind of let it go. Because if I stay too much in it, I don't go to the community. So my really, my allegiance is to them and bringing them to the classic text. It's hard to bring the classic text to the community, if that makes sense. So the mask was a buffer between the audience and they didn't buy it. Right, they just would not get into it. And so I thought it was interesting because I love mask work, right? And I, I love the way they, they were like every people. But in fact, they are every people when they are the women who are sweeping to the neighborhood. And so very quickly I was like, uh-oh, that mask is not helping, right? So I love it, but I think it was better to err towards the audience and pull them in to the text. The other thing that happened that was really beautiful is we tried a mask version in Chicago, and I remember that um, we went to a, a junior high, a middle school, they call them now, and all the kids at this middle school, uh, Cicero was the name of the town, Cicero, and uh, you know, from Chicago, so I loved it, right? And Cicero uh, Middle School it is a gigantic, it's the largest middle school in the middle of the country, and it has, I think, um, like over a thousand uh, seventh graders and they all read Medea, and they all read it in Spanish. Somebody donated the books in the Spanish language version, right? And so the most amazing thing was to then hear from them about how close they were to her as a character and to the chorus, Tita, and to the characters that um, I knew immediately that they were owning these people as part of their community. So I was trying not to create any sort of a buffer but you know, yeah, sometimes you give up some really fun stuff. Yes, shout it out. I am. Yeah, I really wanted to do the Oristaya, but um, I'm getting old. I'm just kidding. I'm, I don't know, what I, but what I really fell in love with that I'm working on is Antigone. And so I have an idea, a really great idea. I haven't shared it with Mary yet, so I have to share it with Mary first. And then in a little cup of tea, and then we'll talk about it. But I have a great idea for Antigone. Who gets, who, who will let us bury this body? Yeah. Um, so 
when you had the house that was raised up, it made me think of Baba Yaga's house. And I was wondering, first of all, you know, was that intentional? And if it was, um, or even if it wasn't, but do you draw on other cultures besides the Greek and the one that you are ostensibly working in? And if yeah. so, how does that sort of affect? Yeah, beautiful. I, th I think, you know, I draw on the, on the community where I'm at. So, you know, uh, Chicago has become a really great second home. So if you, you know, history of Chicago is interesting. The Polish, the Ukrainian, you know, like to get deep, deep underneath that land. So Pilsen, I love this little, there's a place called Little Village, which is a Puerto Rican neighborhood. But Pilsen is like a, a version of East LA. But Pilsen, was Ukrainian, right? Like it's had all these different journeys. And so when you look at the architecture and you look at the houses and you look at the history there, it, it's so fascinating. I worked with um, two specialists, a housing, uh, somebody who worked at the housing authority and somebody who worked for the health department. And you know, the housing authority person was just giving me all the architecture uh, periods. And so in some way, I think that really did influence. But the lifting of the house was the designer Dying, he was really interested to see what was underneath that land. And I think I write so much about land and culture and community. So in the middle of this play, um, my father died. And I had a very, very um, profound relationship with my father. He was my best friend. And I wrote, believe it or not, because it takes a heart, it's a lot to write a play. And you know, you can write a play in about two, three weeks, but it takes a year to really write a play, right? I wrote five plays. I wrote a play called Aesop in Rancho Cucamonga about a little bear who loses her tribe in the fire, foothill fire. I wrote a play called St. Jude that I toured around the country, the story of what happened to my father in the hospital bed and the little pig valve that did not work that eventually ended his life. So, you know, I was writing these plays quick and performing them. And so I was in a deep kind of grief for the longest time. And I think that pulling up and under, looking underneath, what happened is when my father got sick, he was, I already knew he was going to pass, and there was nothing more they can do. He was 82, and they were not going to operate on him again. So uh, he started to have a series of like deep sleeps, which is what was happening. So we were having very profound conversations. Everything I ever wanted to say to my father, I said. And I spent a year in a hospital room with him. So another residency, right? I'd always wanted to learn about hospitals, and God gave me this hospital room with my father to learn everything I wanted to know about what it meant to be in a hospital room. But what happened is my father said, I, I used to want to go back to Mexico, and that's why he was undocumented for 48 years. And then finally he became a citizen because I decided that he had invested so much in this country that he had to die here, right? But he wanted a, like a pauper's funeral. So he, he kind of turned against the Catholicism and the Pentecostalism, which was shocking to me. And what happened was that we brought this old guy from Zamora, Michoacan, where my dad's from in southern Mexico, who still spoke the old language. And we flew him in and came and um, a little patch of land, nothing, a little wooden box, that's what he wanted. Very, very simple. But land and dirt and uh, soil and you know, if you're Chicano, uh, Aslan, our spiritual homeland, the American Southwest, I mean, it just lives in us. We are, of, we are of the earth. That I was raised in a farm worker family is not a coincidence, not a surprise. It is just, it's the essence of me. When I was a kid, my parents would say, we're gonna go on vacation. And we would go to the fields to pick strawberries and I would go, this isn't a vacation, <laughs> right? And so I spent my summers in the fields. I spent my summers picking cherries and grapes and you know, all that stuff. It, the essence of the land. I remember when I was a kid, there was a, a, one of my aunts, my tia Ophelia, I was pregnant, and she and had her daughter out in the middle of the fields. They kind of kept on working. That's who we were. That's the kind of people we were. They rubbed all the earth on her. They blessed her with the soil, our homeland, our land. So all of this really shows up in these plays. It is of a spiritual idea, right? Oh, to be inside of that thing. So the idea of incarceration, the idea of um, gang culture. Um, we have a, a term in Chicano culture called in la quech. Tu eres mi otro yo. You are the other me. When I hurt you, I hurt myself, right? It's a spiritual saying, and we grew up with it. In la quech. You are the other me. We must, we must, I must love you. 
I must love everything about you because that means I love my culture, right? So growing up with all this stuff, I mean, I think that the plays are religious. I mean, they're ritual, you know? They have a lot of ritual in them. There's a lot of silence in these plays. There's a moment in Electricidad where they break the egg and they do the broom and they, you know, they, the, the rum, you know, they do all that stuff, right? Those rituals are really, really important. I, you know, when people would come sometimes, they'd say, you got to be really careful because you just did a whole healing ceremony. Like, well, what am I going to get, a fake egg? I guess I'm going to get a fake egg. But, you know, to do that, to sanctify the space that we are in, that's, that is powerful. That is to go back to the ancients in a very different way. That is to travel back in time in a way that is profound and deep and powerful. So how do I move my community forward by looking back? And how do we take ourselves through these stories into the future, right? And I think that these, I, I just have to say, I think that um, I always knew the Greek tales and I knew the lessons that were there, but it wasn't until I lived them. And so those 10 years on the road prepared me to write the Greeks. It was to live the essence of, of what was really being said. Forgiveness, right? Electricidad. Can she really forgive? Because if she can't, she's going to destroy herself, her family, the community, right? Can Oedipus really turn away from her? Can he really do that? I mean, I, it's getting, will Hassan and Medea really have to, will she really sacrifice that child? And in my version, she sacrifices the child to save him. I don't know how, um, you know, I don't know how audiences sometimes see it in very different ways. But I love that kind of conversation. You know what's powerful? Is every night after the show, having the entire audience stay, and then throwing it back at everyone and saying, what did you think? But how is this your tale, right? And people would say, I'm not sure that I could do that, or I don't know that I could forgive somebody who did such a thing, and you know, that, that kind of stuff. So these profound conversations between the audience, Bob being in and out, that is what I think the Greeks are doing, right? We were having a big open conversation, a festival. And this festival extends into this post moment where we have this conversation with one another, where we meet each other in our fullness, and in our, uh, in our opinions, and in our stories, and in our passions, and in our desires. So I get very excited about Greeks. So excited. Because in some ways, I think that we are um, we are seeing the God in each other. We are still doing the traditional work. And I hope that when you come see one of these plays, and they're trying to do that little you know playwright thing where you know there's a scene where Aegeus, who's now Josefina, says, I will house him, but I cannot, right? So she that line, but I cannot be uh but she say, I will house him for a day, but I cannot be uh, accountable for this. I give these little lines, and then the purists go, ooh, it's the line from the play, right? And so you try to hold on to the purists, and you try to hold on to the community, and you want them to meet each other, because in the end, that is what theater is. We come together to the sport, this extraordinary sport, this live event where we share some energy together, thoughts and opinions, and we, and we, we have a moment of love, church. And so I think that's what I'm trying to do, is elevate that moment for our community. And I'm trying to reach as high as I can in the writing, in the discipline, in the poetry, in the metaphor, all of that stuff. And also speak to the people who have never seen it before. So it was a kind of story at dinner about um, the lesson, my biggest lesson was when I was doing that interesting out the market before. We do an amazing thing where we stop the show for a week at night, and then we run the show every day in the morning for high school kids. So we do this, it's amazing, la la la, you know, Orestes kills the mother, the whole bit. Afterwards, a young man raises his hand, a little high schooler, and he says, so when she dies, do you get a different actor every day? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know that she doesn't really die. And he goes, what? <laughs> they had never been to the theater before. So I said, hold on, so I went and got the actress, because I thought it was important. And she came out, she goes, oh, honey, I don't, this is, a, we're doing a play, it's a ritual. So we start talking, and he is like, oh. <laughs> I lived, I lived for a moment in this scene. I felt her death. I was in this. Oh, that's not right. So that, that's what I want to do. I think there's a moment now that's happening where it's not really about the 
my generation, it's the generation behind me. So that's the generation that I need to move forward, right? We move the field forward. That's why I teach, and that's why I think I do these crazy community things, right? We move the field forward so that the field can then tell us what to do. My moment has passed. It has. I'm a young, I'm in a young man's sport. They're not a young man. So my mentors are all that, right? My mentors are all that. I think it's time to move. And is that our job? Right? I think that's our job. Our job is to move the field forward. And we have to reach back. But we have to take this community with us. And so, the hardest thing is to not judge. And the hardest thing is not to say to that boy, are you stupid? No! <laughs> to say to him, oh, how beautiful. How innocent. How powerful. Right? Yes, this is the ritual. This is the thing we do tonight. We tell the story every night. How amazing. Right? I think we got the drink. So, after that. <laughs>